So a couple months back, um, I, I I preached this series called Never Give Up, and the second part of it was not recorded. <laughs> was not recorded until about like the last two minutes and uh, so I kept saying okay I'm gonna re-record I'm gonna, re I'm gonna re record it and I never did and so here we are <laughs> and I figured you know it's about probably about time that I do that so in the first part of the series I talked about you know hey let's not give up because it's about him we shouldn't give up we shouldn't give up in life and in the ministry and all these different things because it's not about us it's about him it's not our strength, um, it's his ability to carry us through. So to, today, I want to look at Galatians chapter 6, and we're going to look at 10 verses. It says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions, then they can take pride in themselves alone, without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So the first thing I want to say before I even start breaking this down is, you know, if if we as Christians would actually follow the, the instructions that the Bible gives us and compare how we are doing the whole church thing to what the Bible says, I think that the church would be a lot more... Uh, effective not just among ourselves the christians but also in the world and i think that a lot of things that people have a problem with in the church they wouldn't have a basis for it anymore but i think what happens is we kind of get used to the church being kind of like our club and our hangout place and so we don't really even need to worry about how the bible tells us to live we just need to do those things that we know to do and so it becomes okay you know, for us to cause a problem for the pastor. It becomes okay for us to cause a problem with one another, for us to act unwisely, for us to act foolishly, and all these different things because that's the way we do it. That's why we have done it. That's why we were taught to do it. That's the way we see other people doing it. And it's just not good. So Galatians 6, 1 through 10 has this basic outline of, you know, help others. And then it takes a little aside to talk about, you know, the cure for conceit. Because whenever you're helping other people, there's always there's always the risk of being conceited, thinking that you know everything. You're not even really listening to what they have to say anymore because you already know. I mean, think about counseling. How how hard is it when you're counseling to actually sit and listen because you kind of see the same patterns over and over again? So you want to rush ahead to the, here's the answer, you big dummy. When the person, this is their life. I mean, they want to express themselves. They want to be heard. And it might not be as cut and dry as you thought it was as a counselor. But that's hard to remind ourselves to kind of slow down and listen. It, it's way easier to just march ahead. So when we're helping others, as Galatians 6 is talking about, we have that risk of being conceited, of, of being arrogant, of being prideful, thinking that we know it all, thinking that we can't learn, we, and there, there's nothing new under the sun. So we, we, get, we get conceited. So then it talks about how to, how to cure that. And then the end of this passage that we looked at is talking about how to help leaders. Um, so there's there, there's a, those three basic stages. So let's start with Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, and we'll, we'll read verse 1 and 2. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. And I, I just, I just got to say this. It's so easy for us to say, oh, I, I, I'm Spirit-filled. I live by the Spirit. I'm so righteous. I'm a good Christian. But we treat others like garbage. If we really are living by the Spirit, then our, our, our goal here should be to restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So, first off, help help one another. That's, that's the real basic thought here. If someone is caught, basically, hey, help each other. That's the, that's the summary of this whole thing. But something that's important to notice from that is, to realize that, yes, we are responsible. We are responsible to one another. We're responsible to help each other. We're responsible to get help. None of us is an island. So we have this, sometimes this idea that, 
you know, I can just do whatever I want and people can't tell me how to, how to live. They can't, they can't correct me. I'm doing nothing wrong. Or, you know, you know what? They're just going to live however they want and, and that's good. We have to agree to disagree. When the church is more meant to be um, not necessarily, not, not a policing force. That's definitely the wrong kind of concept. But the church is meant to be like a family that is, that is there for each other, that they, that they you know, they, they work together. But the problem is, is that in our society, families by and large are pretty, um, mm, the, uh, pretty immature and broken and fragmented and um, uh, not corrupted, but uh, where they don't work as they should. And so because our earthly families are, are messed up and not really cohesive and, and, and a uni unified uh, force to be reckoned with, uh, we take that same thought to the church and we say, okay, well, so this is how we do things in the church too. I mean, uh, I, I, I hate my dad. I talk bad about him all the time. So it's okay for me to talk bad about the pastor because I mean, why not? Why, I mean, we aren't robots. Like I can voice my own opinion. And so we start doing these little things that sound good, even though they go against what the Bible tells us how to live our lives. We, we make these little compromises because our experience will oftentimes trump God's truth. God will say, this is the way it should be. This is the way I want you to do it. And we'll say, yeah, no, no, I heard what you said. It's just that that's not really um, how I I think we should do things because I've experienced, I know better. I, I've been there. I've done that. And um, so the first thing, yes, we are absolutely responsible to each other. It, it's, we can't just do whatever we want. We are not an island. We do have to answer to our, to each other. So carry each other's burdens. We are, we are th Think about just how, how intimate that sounds carry the burdens don't ridicule the burdens don't point make fun don't gossip don't complain we're talking about carrying each other's burdens there's a lot more uh, uh intimacy to it than that uh, and, and while you're doing this by the way watch out watch out because you know you're going to be tempted you're you, you're going to you're going to you're going to think that you're better you're going to think that you have it all all under control that you don't need anybody else's help so be careful that takes us to verses three and four if anyone thinks there is something when they are not well they, just, they deceive themselves so, so don't think that you are better than them. Well, you know, um, I didn't need help. They did. I have it all together. They're the one who keeps messing up here. And here's a little, a little thing I want you to get. Everybody messes up. Okay, it doesn't matter how mature you are. Everybody, first off, everybody needs each other. We need each other. But then also more than that, everybody messes up. Like, just because someone else messes up in a more visible way doesn't mean that you're not messing up. Like, for instance, you are being judgmental. <laughs> you're being a, um, what's it called? Um, you're being ungracious. And you are being, um, being uh, what's a word? Uh, not just judgmental, but um, um, unloving. Uh, there's another word I'm looking for. Um, you are being um, condemning. Uh, uh, sometimes even jealous. Uh a little bit envious sometimes. You are, li are have have a sin in your heart of how you how you're viewing this other person. You're not giving them grace. You're not trying to carry their burdens. You're not trying to help them. You couldn't care a rip about them. But that's not visible. But the thing that they're doing, oh, that's visible. So I mean, it, it's okay because I'm obviously better than them because my sins aren't so public. But here's the thing: I found that the more private the sin, the bigger of a deal it is. First off, because it continues to spread and grow. Second off, because we, we fall into, into a, a, like a false sense of, uh, of comfort and it's okay. And, uh, and, and also because those things are really the root things. The visible things, those things are like the, the, the introductory things that you should stop doing. You know, like, hey, you know, you should stop sleeping around. You should stop getting drunk. I mean, these are just basic ideas. I mean, it's a real simple idea, concept. It's not that difficult. But once you get past those simple, obvious things that, that need to be changed to be a Christian, right? To, 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 not to be a Christian. We are saved by grace through faith. But to, uh, to be in obedience to God, you know. Then there's these other deeper things, and it's like a, a, an onion. You know, it, um, God will peel back layers, and there'll be another layer there, and we won't, we won't want to hear it. Or maybe it'll be like um, a field. We we we, we sow the field, or, or, or you know, we're, we we've got the hoe, and, and when we're dragging through the field, we get all these big rocks, but we throw them out, and then we keep going, and we're, and we're getting the dirt ready, and we find more rocks. And so you, you keep going, in, and and the more you do it, the more rocks you find. It's like it's, it's like somebody keeps putting rocks in your garden. And that's kind of how it is. Like at first, we, we move the most obvious stuff, and it's real obvious. Every, everybody can see it. And then we get better and better at hiding it and, and not as good at um, surrendering it to God. So if anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. 
Um, so don't think that you're better better than than than, than them, whoever them is. Um, what we do is we compare ourselves to that screw up over there, especially when we help them. So, oh yeah, I screw I I helped up that screw up them. They're so so messed up. Um, so if anyone thinks they are something when when they are not, but remember remember that we are not. We oftentimes are not the prize, but even if we were the prize before we were saved, like if we were the world's smartest person, okay. Remember that we are not anything because of our greatness. We're something because Christ adopted us. See, it's that humility that helps us to remember as we're helping other people that we still do need help. Each one should test their own actions. Weigh, weigh your heart. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. So what we do is we think, oh, I'm better than them, the person that I'm helping. But... <laughs> The, the, that's not the issue. <laughs> the issue is, you know, hey, what, what am I doing? What What's going on with me? And then not, am I better than them? Like, what, what's going on with me in comparison to them? But am I the same person I was a month ago? Am I am I growing in Christ? Am I am I more secure in Christ? Am I trusting him more? What we do is when we go through hard times, we look and we say, why, God, why, why are you giving this to me? I've been a good Christian. Why don't you give it to them? They hate you. And that right there shows that that we are not we we're still comparing ourselves to others. We're not we're not living by faith. It's all about the appearance. So let's let's compare this um, with two other translations. This was the NIV right here. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone. So that kind of is confusing. They take pride in ourselves. What does that mean? Without comparing themselves to someone else. So then we look at the NASB and it says each each one must examine his own work. And I think that's probably probably uh, more clear than test their own actions. Examine his own work. Look at your life. What is the effect of you? When, when you do you bring peace in a situation or chaos? Um, are, you, uh, are, are you helping people and healing people or are you hurting them? Um, what's going on in your heart? Is your heart just bitter and, 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 and resentful and discontent? What, what, what is going on there? Examine his own work and then he will have reason for boasting. I know there's a lot of Christians who say, well, I, I used to do this, I used to do that, but well, what are you doing for Christ now? But to himself alone and not to another. So now let's look at the NLT, and I think this really, really helps to get across the point of what's being said here. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. And I think that that's probably a, a good way to just, you know, real summarize what's being said here. Um, so objectively look at yourself. Ex objectively weigh yourself. Where are areas that you need to grow? Where are areas that you're doing well on? What are areas that you could, you know, okay, so here, here's a good example. I went to college and I thought I knew everything. So I, I kind of stopped. And the reason why is because it was all about knowledge. I felt like I was at a point of knowledge where there was nothing else to learn. And that was good. It was It's good to know. It's good to know about the Bible or faith. That's, that's great. But that's the bare, bare basic starting point. And so what a lot of pastors do is they just don't even talk about knowledge, that, you know, doctrine, those kinds of things. They only focus on leadership development. And that, that that's wrong. That's the next um, extreme. See, the, it's good to have a basis of knowledge. But from that basis of knowledge, you go somewhere with that. And you say, okay, so I, I have an understanding of the Bible and of what I believe and why I believe. But the next step is then to serve others and then the next step after that is then to pour into others to pour into others so we're going from from growing and, and learning to you know and being taught obviously to uh to serving others and then helping others to serve others so there, there's two stages even of, of serving people in your life there's direct serving somebody like you would do at like a food pantry but then there's another level that oftentimes people, Christians, never get to. And that's where you are helping others to help others. So instead of, let's say, for instance, volunteering at the food pantry, you are helping the one who volunteers at the, at the food pantry to, to help others. See what I mean? Like there, there's levels in it. And, and it starts to, as you grow and mature, there, there's more that's required of you. There's more opportunity for you. There's... I think I'm thinking. I'm th currently I'm thinking of a guy. His name's Sam Chan. He, he's he used to be a pastor. He used to uh, be a uh, a dean at a school, um, if I'm, I'm, or a president. Maybe he was the president of the school. And then he went to um, he started an organization where he helps pastors to get their church in order. So then, what's the next step after the pastors go to him and get their church in order? 
Well, the next step is for them to help, to look for who they can help get their ministry into order. Think of how wonderful it would be, for instance, if pastors started to intern people who felt like they were called to ministry. So instead of them just going out and having to get a position and trial and error and all that stuff, or just having somebody somewhere where they go and clean toilets, they could actually get firsthand um, experience as to how to pastor, how to you know be what they need to be as a pastor firsthand from another pastor who's doing that thing. And then they could go from there and get their own church. How, how wonderful would that be? So, I mean, I think that that really, that really summarizes it very well. Um, this, this whole process of, you know, don't think that you're better. Uh, objectively look at yourself. Weigh, weigh your actions. Uh, look at the, the result of, of, of what your life is, is, is achieving of what you're thinking about in private, what you're meditating on. The Bible says, let, 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 the, let the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. Let what's going on inside, not just the things that I'm saying, not just the things that I'm, that I'm doing, not just the things I'm thinking, but the very meditations, the, thing, the core of, of what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking up and I think about. Am I worrying about stuff? Am I seeking God? Am I uh, stewing about somebody who did me wrong? Am I thinking about God? So look what God has done in me. Look, look at where God has brought me from. Not, not look at how much better I am than them, but look at where God has brought me to. Look at what God has done in me and in my life. And that, that's an amazing thing to recognize. Not, not looking down on others, but looking at yourself and saying, Wow, God, you brought me all this way. And there's a whole different attitude between that and, Oh man, I'm doing so good, or I'm doing so much better than them. So then verse five, verses 5 and 6 says, For we are each responsible for our own conduct, our load, our burden, uh, our burden of, of, of life. We're all responsible uh, for, our, for our own conduct. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. So let's kind of break this down. We are aware of our burdens. That's important. As you're weighing yourself, you become aware of your burdens. And you are carrying your burdens, absolutely. At the end of the day, that is your burden to carry. I mean, think of, for instance, a person who's depressed. You can be around other people, but at night when you're all alone, who's there with you? Just yourself and your thoughts. We know our hearts. We know what we're struggling with. We can hide from people, but the truth is we still know what, know what our burdens are. And it's nobody else's job to carry that for us. If, if I'm a bitter person, that's, that's not on anybody else. It's my burden to carry to the Lord. If I'm having a hard time trusting God, that, that's not something that somebody else can fix for me. That's something that I have to be willing to take that step. So more so than just be a blessing to each other, it's also be a blessing to those over you, which would be like leaders and teachers and preachers, those kinds of things. Be a blessing to them, which, which by, by requirement, you know, is you being submitted to your authority, absolutely. But how, what does that look like? Well, that looks like financial, obviously. You want to financially uh, be a blessing to those over you. You know, that, that, that is an important part of obeying God. But it goes more and beyond that. Um, th there's other ways that you should share all good things with your, with your instructor. So one thing that I can think of is they teach you, you grow. So you, in turn, encourage them. You, in turn, um, uh, serve in ministries. You, in turn... Uh, you know, give ideas maybe, you in turn um, see an open door of ministry and, and you go through there and it's a blessing to them. When pastors see you get involved with something, a start a ministry, that is something that uh, it means that the fruit of them pouring into you has been, is, is growing. It's, it's been realized. Don't, don't take for granted what the, what the pastor is doing. Don't take for granted the time that he spends and the energy that he spends. Um, don't, don't be a taker where you're just always um, wanting more and more 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 entertainment more more pleasure you know everybody to cater around you you're never giving up anything for anybody don't don't be a master of being a critic this is what they're doing wrong this is what what their how the ministry is done this is what they should do this is nah, 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 nah. you know and it's just that constant criticism and complaint and and, and, and whatnot there's a difference between refining something this is something where, where, where friends are talking amongst themselves maybe the pastor has an associate pastor for instance versus somebody who is just disgruntled and has a, a laundry list of things that the pastor needs to change. And that's not really a blessing. That, that's a burden. Um, and so then that takes us to verses 7 through 8, and it says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. People reap what they sow. 
whoever sows to, to please their flesh from the flesh will reap in destruction. Not instruction, sorry, destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. So the things that we do in life definitely have a way of coming back on us, right? Think about our finances, how we spend them. And, oh, no, I'm living my best life, and then a month later, we're in credit card debt. Um, oh, well, you know, I, I, I'm serving this person. So, okay, if you're serving them in truth, you'll find a way of, of, of that comes back one way or another. So um, maybe you help somebody who, who grows into a strong, mature Christian. You have a friend. Or maybe you did it with, um, excuse me, with ulterior motives and it kind of blew up in your face. Uh, maybe you gave somebody, somebody counseling because of something that was irritating to you rather than something that could help them. And so as a result, you lose their friendship. Um, maybe, uh, maybe you um, uh, try and overwrite somebody else's ministry and, and, and ignore the whole authority, chain of authority. And so then in the future, you know, you have people who don't, don't follow your authority. And, uh, you know, it, it has ways of coming back. How you treat people has, has a way of, of showing back on, on you. Um, your kids, for instance, see how you treat people. Um, you want kids to feel, to feel safe and secure, love their mother with your whole heart. I mean, you, 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 have, to, you have to stop talking, talking nonsense where they can hear and, and about her and treating her like crap. And then they will change how they're, that they'll take their cues from, from what you are doing. Um, when, when you take advantage of leaders, it has a way of coming back on you. So the things that you build in life, maybe friendships or relationships, how, 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 um, how your kids treat you, and it, it comes back in that way. Um, are you living for you or are you living for God? Here's a good test. Ch look and see where does your time and your money go. And that will tell you whether you're living for yourself or for God. So that takes us to verse 9. Well, let's just read through this again. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. People reap what they sow. When you when you mistreat leaders, when you mistreat um, other other Christians, you know that that's he's not going to let that go, whether it's in this life or, or the next life. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. I remember there was a time in my life where, where I was literally done with pain. And I said, you know what, this is nonsense. I'm not doing this anymore. And I made it a thing where I was, I, I'm going to live my life. Um, I'm going to be carefree and I'm going to enjoy life. And I made, and I didn't realize it, but I made a conscious decision at that time to make my life about pleasure. So look at your life and wait. Am I, am I, am I sowing to please my flesh? And I'm not talking about buying a book that you want to want to want to read or or playing video games. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about where your life is all about you, and the focus of your life is about you, and, and being happy and being pleasured, and uh, basically what people are doing with this with this false gospel, where it's all about us, and uh, you know uh, where we where we go to any any given thing in life, and, and our main concern is more about us than about the kingdom. And that is the deciding factor. Oh, I don't want to be a pastor because I don't think that I'll have fun. I think that it'll hurt. I think that it'll be a pain. You know? Uh, so whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. You, you know, you can't pour all your energy and effort into this life and then be surprised when you are destroyed by this life. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. God is the one that we are, we are sowing for. That has not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. If we do not give up. So there's a lot of things that I, I, I thought that this verse was talking about. And I was just so wrong. So let's, 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 there's so many things I want to say about this. There's just so much. First off, doing the right thing and serving or serving in ministry are things that, those are, those are, those are long plays, not short plays. Most of the time, you won't see the consequences, right? So you 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 change your kid's diaper. You you feed them. You treat them. You 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 teach them the basics. You teach them about God, and then they you know blow up on you and they hate you and they leave. And then when they're thirty, they they, they, they all the work was worth it because they're they're a mature adult who loves the Lord with the whole heart, and they're you know uh, they're back on speaking terms with you and stuff. And things have changed. They've gotten older. They they understand things more that you know being a parent themselves that they see things clearer 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 
But either way, you, you do the right thing and you, you serve others. And at the right, and there will be, you will reap a harvest from that. But you can't give up by nature. If you give up, you don't you don't get anything from it. That's just by nature of it. Let's say I plant seeds, but I just I just give up. Well, the stocks are going to grow. I mean, the stocks are aren't the stocks aren't going to continue to grow. The corn will die, and you know, then I'll have nothing but a ruined field. You have to see something through. You can't just you know have sex with a woman and have a and have a baby. You have to raise the child, right? I mean, it's a process. And at the proper time, you're going to see a harvest. Maybe in this life, maybe in the next. But either way, there will be a harvest from it. So you, and there's a lot of different ways that this could apply. This is more of a principle. And, but let's, let's plow ahead. You do not, I'm sorry, you do right because you will reap a reward. May, you don't really know, you know, when. So the question being what? What reward? Well, sometimes we try to do good to others so that they will change. But here's the thing, they don't always change. So what reward are we talking about then? If we're not talking about the people changing, well, maybe the situation will change. Well, hold on. Maybe the situation won't, though. Or, and, and, and so if it, here's the thing. This verse is not promising that the person will change, and it's not promising that the situation will go away. This is what it's promising. Even if it's slow or unnoticed, good will come out of it. God will repay. Now we don't know what that we don't always know what that looks like, and sometimes God will give us a specific promise of what that looks like, and sometimes He won't. That's just the way it is. We don't know. So verse ten says, "Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers." Now I don't know about you, but when I grew up in the church, it was a very hostile environment. Um. You know, pe people love talking about you know getting people saved and whatnot, but they didn't care. They didn't care about the people in their cities, in their communities. They sent their money for missionaries, but then they refused, refused to tell people that Jesus where they lived. And then in the church was a cesspool. And we're talking about a swamp, where everybody is after each other. They all hate each other. They're all gossiping and and, and talking nonsense about each other. I mean, it was just a cesspool. But yeah, what he says here is. Do do good to all people. If the opportunity presents itself, do good, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. See, God is expecting for us to treat each other better. We are we are like we are supposed to be like a family. We're supposed to pour into each other even more so than we did others. Not that we're supposed to neglect others. Not supposed to, not that we're supposed to neglect the world, but the church is supposed to be known as being even more so loving and watching out for each other, not less especially to those who belong to the family of believers. And I tell you what, it is harder to love the family of believers. You have to learn to forgive. You have to learn how to live together. And your your love of the community will, will directly be tied to your love for one another. If you don't love God with your whole heart, you will not love people who you have seen. And if you can't love the church, you will never love the world. And it's somewhere in here that everybody always has this idea of, oh, I love everybody. And it's like, we're not talking about, uh, yes, the, the, more, the more abstract concept of I love everybody. We're talking about the people that you know that you hate the most. Do you love them? Do you, do you serve them? Do you care for them? Do you pray for them? So seize the opportunity for good. So, okay, so what, 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 what was he just talking about? Well, for one, he was talking about the leaders. How can you do good to a pastor? How can you do good, do good for your pastor? How can you do good for your pastor when you don't like him? Seize the opportunity for good. How can you do good for someone who is really struggling? They're not mature, and they are just not getting it. They keep stumbling over and over again. How can you do good for them? So something I want you to get from all of this is that God never promises a reaction from someone. Hey, if you do good, then they will repent, they will turn from their sin, they will repay you in like measure, and they will overwhelm you with goodness, you'll get financial blessing. And here's the thing. He does not ever say that. God never promises a reaction from someone else. He didn't say if you continue to do good that you will reap an action of them changing, of them doing what you want them to do. That's not what he said. 
and I, I and if, I, if I'm honest, most of the time that I've my time in church and growing up in the church, I've seen this happen over and over and over again. Where it's like, no, 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 I am doing the right thing, and I will reap a reward of this person being changed. And it's like, well, you, you can't. God's not going to promise somebody else because He's not going to force them into it. He's going to still give them their free will. So a bigger lesson here is when we do, when we endure, we will see something for our endurance. That's just the way of it. I mean, think of this. If I don't feed my dog, that dog will starve to death and die. That would be the consequences of my refusing to do it, right? We can all agree on that. When we endure, we see something for our endurance. It's easy to see the bad things that happen because they kind of pile up. You know, it's almost like almost like if you just do nothing, everything just slowly descends into complete anarchy and hell, right? But uh, the same is true for doing something and, and, for, and for enduring and, and for being patient and faithful and, and serving. As we do those things, we will see something for it. When you, when you raise your kids, you love them to the end. And you will see something for that. So, okay, why not, why not give up? Why not give up? Well, we looked at it last week because it's about him. It's not about us, right? It, we, we don't give up because it's not about us. It's, it's about him. And the, the, the second thing there, the second reason why we don't give up, I mean, well, let's just back up and look at that first one for a little bit. I know we talked about it before, but let's look at that again. Because it's about him. It's not about our pain and our limited suffering. We have such a reward waiting for us. God doesn't owe us anything because of what we went through. We get, we get to be involved with his plans. It's about him, not us. See, he has this dream that he's given us. To see people get saved. And so we follow along, and sometimes we need to struggle so that others can find him. That is the process of it. That's the beauty of it. It's about him. So why else not give up? If you don't do something, event, I'm sorry, if you, if you don't give up, let me just say that differently. If you don't give up, something eventually comes of it. Why shouldn't you give up? Because something's going to come out of it. You don't know what it is right now because you're on this side of it. But then you'll know. I remember as a kid thinking about, oh, um, and this will never, th this thing will never happen, and oh, I just can't wait for it to happen. And then when it was happening, it was like surreal, like wow, this thing really happened. And then inevitably, I'd be on the other side of it, looking back and say, oh, that thing happened. It's reality now. If you do, that guarantee. If you if you do succeed, if you if you do not not succeed, uh, if you do keep going, that guarantees success. But if you do give up, that guarantees no success. That promises no success. The, the surest way to make sure that you, that your plans fail and and you, what, what you're doing does not come to fruition is to quit. It guarantees that no good will come from it. It is a final decision. It doesn't fix it. Quitting doesn't fix it. It's just, it, it gives a final conclusion to the matter. Think about life. Oh, I'm going to kill myself. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done fighting. So the, the problem doesn't go away. You just quit dealing with it. So now it's for sure not going, not going to, to change. Oh, I'm, 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 we've decided we're going to get a divorce. So you're changing one problem for another problem. That's a final decision, and it, it's it's not going to fix it. It's going to ensure that nothing good comes from it. Well, this this marriage can't be fixed. Okay, A, you don't know that. You don't know that. And B, there's good reason to not give up. Something will come out of it. Well, you know, if something was going to happen, it would have by now. Here's the thing, and I, I want you to get acquainted with this word. It's called yet. It's a very important little word. You're all right. Some, uh, nothing has happened. Nothing has come from it. Yet. One thing you could do is you could change your tactics. Sometimes people sugarcoat so that they can be friends with people, and they waste time playing games. Instead of just going to the person saying, look, um, you know, I really feel like we need to talk about this. You know, I remember there was a friend that I had that I kept trying to sugarcoat things, and I, and I didn't want to I didn't want to address it anymore. And I almost addressed it one time. Um, I, sent, I sent her a text and said, you know, I, I, I see the same thing that got in this person. It, it's in you. And she blew up, and I just backed off. I was just like, yeah, you, you know, you're right. It, it's, the, the problem's me. And I just backed off. And I shouldn't have. 
because the longer I tried to sugarcoat it and, and all this different stuff, it, it didn't fix the problem. It just delayed the inevitable. But also, you don't have to be overly abrasive. Maybe you're just an abrasive, rude person. You can change that. Try changing tactics and see if something else comes from it. What we do is, oh, I'm enduring, I'm suffering, when you're the one causing so much suffering to other people. Oh, I'm just a waste of space. Of space. Others are, are just better off without me, so it's better if I quit. Here's the thing, I don't know. I, I don't I don't know if, if you are if others are better off without you. I don't know if you're a waste of space. I don't know those things. But I know that God made you on purpose. God made you on purpose. He meant to make you. It's not your place to decide when to die. It's your place to keep on keeping on. If you are hurting others, if that's true that you're, others are better off without you because you're hurting them, so learn to stop. Go to counseling. Do whatever is necessary and learn how to stop hurting people. Well, I can't stop. I've tried yet. You can't stop yet. It's a skill that you have to learn. If you, already, if you had already learned it, you would be saying right now, I can do that. So instead of saying, oh, I can't do that, I can't do that yet. How does this, this apply to you? Here's the thing. We like, as people, as Christians, we like complaining about things. We like complaining about problems and not praying about them. We get in a problem, what do we do? We complain about it. God, why are you letting this happen? You know, why won't you take this away? Why, what have I done to anger you? Instead of praying. Instead of seeing that God has a purpose, that God can, can bring something great out of the most miserable of things that we can endure. God can bring something wonderful if we would only just seek him and wait. That's all we got to do because God is always working. We, we just have to catch up and see that this pain is an opportunity. We have to consciously control our thinking. So why shouldn't you give up? Well, it's God's business to create us. Our days are God's business. Our death, that's God's business. It, it's, not, it's not up to you. It's God's business, not, not yours. You, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about about when when if you should give up and when 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 you should just quit and all these different things. You don't have to worry about that. You have to pray for grace as you're going through it. Because here's the thing, and once you get this, faith is living. Faith is choosing to live. You're going through pain, you're going through heartaches. Faith is living. And that choosing to live and not and not, and not give up and not quit. I'm trusting God. He's moving me forward. I'm going to keep seeking Him, and that is your faith. It's not up to you. You don't have to worry about the day of your death or, or how many days you have, or, or whether whether it's time to give up or how much longer you can go. You, you don't have to worry about any of that. It's not your area of concern. Giving up robs others of the you that could help. Giving up robs others of the you that could help. There's things that you would have said, things that you would have done. I, I, I think about all these pastors um, in, in more modern times that have, have you know, committed suicide, and it really discourages me because I've been discouraged too. I've, I've been depressed too. I've been suicidal before too, and I didn't give up. And then I see them give up, and I oh. and that's one more person that knew exactly what I was going through that now they're not there anymore. See, giving up, it doesn't, it doesn't fix the problem. It passes on the hurt. It ensures that the problem continues. It robs others of the you that could have helped. So you have to learn how to change your beliefs even when you don't feel it. You know, I, I just feel like I'm a waste of space. I feel like nothing I do is good enough. You have to change those beliefs, even when you don't feel it. No, it's God's timing. You know, I feel like it's time for me to just give up. I don't want to fight anymore. But that's not my choice anymore. That's God's choice. So instead, I'm going to choose to believe that he's got me here for a reason. If it was my time to die, he would have taken me. And that's it. So instead of wondering about all these different things about when, how much longer you can hold on and, and whether you should just give up and all these different things, use a time given to you for good. Everybody has a limited span of life, just like everybody has a limited paycheck. Use that time wisely. Use, use that money wisely. Use time given to you for good. 
Use the time that you have for good. Try to pour into others. Try and help others. Try and serve and love others. Here's the thing. Don't worry. Don't let your main concern be about others' attitudes or, or just trying to people please, right? Oh, well, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Here's the thing. If that's your attitude, you will, you will hurt feelings, and you will have given up your purpose and your goal in life too. I'm not saying you should try and irritate people. I'm definitely not saying that. But, oh, people don't like me or people don't like the church. Don't worry about it. Okay, you do what's right, and if you've done something wrong, then fix it and keep on going. Don't worry about others' attitudes or, or, or if they're happy. I remember um, we were trying to start this men's center at the church, and uh, it got to be um, where where the – it got to be where the um, – where we had this community meeting to kind of explain things, and it became more of a petition. They all came there to voice their complaints about it. And man, they, they really hated uh, hated uh, what we were doing. They hated the church for that. But we were trying to do the right thing. Um, and these are these are three points that, from a different sermon, but I just want to remind remind you of them. First off, we don't have to wait to have joy in life. You can seek God now, and in the midst of your of your greatest struggles, you can find new joy from God. If you will just focus in on God. And, and, and consciously change your thoughts to worshiping him and think about him, things will change. We think, oh, there's no hope, there's no, there's, no, there's no light at the end of this tunnel because we haven't experienced it yet. So we're arguing from something we haven't experienced, something we don't know. But God can bring something out of it. God can show us something where there isn't. We can experience something that we don't know about. Let God show you what you don't know. Because there is there is stuff out there that God wants to show you that you that you don't know. There is peace that you don't know. There is comfort that you don't know. There, there's purpose and, and ministry and, and and joy and all these things that you don't know. That you don't know. 